David's Log, August 2023. The USS Horror Cult Films podcast has so far made four stops on our journey to go where many other podcasts have gone before. So far, we have engaged with eight Star Trek films and a two-part episode. Today, we continue our voyage to our final destination of the Kelvin timeline. But first, we must depart from the Next Generation crew, visiting Insurrection and Nemesis. Well, joining me on what promises to be a brilliant adventure, as always, are my helm officer, Mr. Alsder Yule. Aye, aye, Captain. And my chief astrophysicist, Mr. Jim Lamming. On to beam up. And we are absolutely delighted to be talking about films 9 and 10, starting with Insurrection. It is human nature to wonder what it would be like to never grow old, to experience utter peace and harmony. And it is also human nature for some of us to want what we do not have. Insurrection! So, this is a bit of a swashbuckling adventure, isn't it? Like, tonally, the jump from 7 and 8 to this is so noticeable. Like, I, it's like they've gone with quite an old-fashioned Star Trek formula here, you know, go down to a planet, solve a local dispute using some form of uh, morality, and then you just sort off and go on another adventure, right? So, would you say that that's fair? This is a return to a classic Star Trek? In a way... Yeah, the impression I get from it overall is mid-season filler episode. Agreed. <laughs> I've been watching a lot of Star Trek recently. Or, well, over the last year since we've started this. And it, it very much feels like, you know, we're just going to pad out the season a little bit till we get to the main event that's coming up. And it, it feels a little too understated compared to the previous films we've seen. Yeah, because it occurs to me, in terms of the cinematic aspects, the beginning does put us in this frame of mind. We have this, frankly, beautiful score coming in here, and we have this very nice village environment that's being constructed. Now, that looks pretty cool. That says, hey, we're doing something pretty epic here. And then you're right that it doesn't really capture that feeling beyond the first 20 minutes or so. You know, once they sort of touch down on the planet, it does feel quite uh, quite small and, you know, quite impersonal. Just a, maybe a little bit, as maybe filler, a tri- bit trivial. What do you reckon, Alistair? I find the stakes in this film to be very, very low compared to virtually ev- every other cinematic Trek outing. This is like a village of people, a little hamlet of townsfolk that don't want to move. Compared to, you have to remember the Borg Cube was attacking Earth in the previous film, and in the next mm. one we're going to have a uh, Thaler on radiation. So this film's, it would be a filler episode of the TV show, but it would also do, if they were to do away with aspects like the Duck Blind, the Collector, the Hollow Ship, you could simplify this into a single episode. There's like a sort of almost Krypton Factor style of uh, obstacles to, that have been thrown in the way to add out the length of this film. I think that uh, it's it's a bit bloated for what it is, but I, I do agree that the the scenery, the visuals, the on location shooting that looks stunning. It looks great, and the soundtrack is absolutely flawless. It's great from start to finish. I just wish the story justified those things. I completely agree with you about the sort of series of obstacles approach we have, because a lot of them are introduced and then dealt with quite quickly, then they move on like, oh no, it's a cave-in. You resolve that. Oh no, here come some robots. <laughs> they shoot the drones down, the silly CGI drones. And this sort of feels like a series of, I say, little things that are just there to kind of pad it out, but we don't have an existential threat there. And mm-hmm. you could argue, well, Wrath of Khan didn't have an existential threat either. You go, fine, granted it didn't, although I suppose we could use Khan having the... Uh, this weapon that can essentially destroy planets if he wants to use it. But at the same time, what it did have was a personalised conflict, and this one doesn't. Disagree in the sense of an existential conflict in Wrath of Khan is that Khan very clearly wanted to kill Kirk. 
but he wanted Kirk to know who had beaten him, but he he didn't care how many of the Enterprise crew or even his own people died in the pursuit of that vengeance. In this film, we've got we've got Admiral Dougherty, who, for all of his bending and breaking of the rules, doesn't really have much stomach for violence. He's not a sadist. And Ruafo, he's not out to kill anyone at the beginning, but he, he's the more he's pushed, the more he resists that, and he becomes more violent as the, the film progresses. Yeah, you're right, there's no personalised conflict in this with anyone. It's, it, it just is, the film is sort of missing a heart, I would say. Yeah, I mean, when it's, just to clarify when I was saying with Khan was I was meaning that like Khan's not threatening to blow up the entire Federation. He's got a grudge against a particular captain and probably the rest of the crew. He's, I mean, you say existential, that means like you're, you don't want, that's a threat to your existence. You don't want to not exist. And Khan, in that sense, is existential to Kirk, that, which is what I said, yes. with Ruafo, who is the one character willing to kill in Insurrection. He doesn't set out wanting to kill. He has to be pushed to it. And then he does want to kill. So it, Ruaf one can come from different starting points. You know what I mean? Um, where it's not existential to begin with, but it gets towards that. I th- think with Doherty, for something that bothered me about him, um, so I was surprised to learn that he's not in any other episodes because mm-hmm. of like the sort of significance of uh, him being a villain could almost have been a bit like... Uh, you know, the first Mission Impossible where Jim Phelps is a baddie, right? We're like, oh, that's that's a nice little twist. Whereas, you know, it's not like this guy stands in for the Federation typically. And he's also introduced as a villain because you go, oh, I wonder if the baddie's going to be. Oh, do you think it's going to be that guy who's standing beside the decaying monsters? <laughs> like, it's, like, it, it, it plays its cards far too early to the extent, and, and, and Nemesis might well do the same thing. But it plays its cards very, very early, and it just sort of means that we're waiting for the announcement we already know. We're waiting for the, the, for the penny to drop here for Picard. And there wasn't really much of a sense of betrayal because the audience hasn't been betrayed. We don't know this guy, except that he's a baddie. But, oh, what do you know? It turns out he's a baddie. Mm. I mean, he's... Fun fact about uh, Phelps from Mission Impossible. The original actor from the TV show refused to come back and play the character because of that twist. Just thought you might like to know that. There's a certainly wealth of uh, characters that they could have drawn on from the series and didn't. And there's certainly admirals that have had their disagreements with Picard, who they just didn't choose to use. But if Dougherty had been a recurring character in the TV show, his Dougherty out would no doubt have been another one of the track memes Oh, God, yeah, he says that an awful lot, even just in the first half of the film. I, I think with him as well, it's sort of... The, the scene when we've got the conflict between, between him and uh, him and Picard, you know, as we're having our sort of face-off of each other, I think one big problem with that scene is it kind of shows how how poor the motivation on both sides of this conflict are, right? Where the Baku going... Well, we have an inherent right to this fountain, which we don't. We're not. We're not native to the planet. No. There isn't. There isn't a colonial sta- a- a- angle to this. They are. They are the colonizers, frankly. And, they settled there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and at the same time, it strikes me as the uh, on the other side of this, you go, well, why don't they just set up camp on the other side of the planet? In hell, you could cover that planet ninety five percent hospitals, and they would never have to encounter the Baku at any point. But they're like, well, no, because we want to, we want to, we want to steal all this, all, all the um, whatever substances and <laughs> rings. We want to steal this metaphasic some, radiation. Yes, because some of them, some of them would die if we just left them down the planet. You go, well, mm-hmm. some of them would die, like, <laughs> right? You know, we're going to die if you don't do it. So you may, so you may as well just put them down down to the planet, and then you're not clearly going against the uh, the typical morality of uh, the Federation. Mm-hmm. So I, I I just had issues with this entire conflict. I mean, essentially, the baddies in this are like the Nationalized Health Service, where they're saying, all right, we want to get this free medicine and distribute it to the rest of the galaxy. And they're going, no, right? <laughs> we're meant to be on the side of the Baku of that. Like, the Baku are absolute assholes. Oh, yeah. I also just don't like that they couldn't come to the compromise of going, oh, well, why don't we just set up some, like, you know, hospitals here? Like, it, it's almost beneath Picard to be so aggressively fighting for Baku rather than, because 
there's a question that should be asked of this, and it never gets asked, and that is, hey, do you think it'd be a good idea to leave so we can distribute all this medicine to everyone, right? And if that question came in, one of two things would happen. They could go, yeah, it's a good idea, conflict solved, or they go, no, and look like the assholes that they are. So it's where, like, aggression is being used against them because it's a way of framing them as the good guys, but they really are not the good guys in this scenario. They are not. <laughs> 600 people do not an entire planet make. Yeah, I mean, you also know that as Spock goes around, he would just say the good of the many always outweighs the good of the few or the one, right? Star Trek's missed its own message. Exactly, like, there's no way that, that he would go, all right, yeah, there's no, there's no solution here. Ah, Jim, what do you think of the message of this film? Well, weren't they Starfleet deserters as well? So... <laughs> Is this, are you referring you know, to Picard when he takes his pips off? <laughs> no, it's um, the, the actual settlers on the planet had rejected Starfleet, hadn't they? Or am I getting... No, uh, they'd rejected no. technology, but they... I think you would need to be members of the Federation before you could leave the Federation. I think it's similar to like a Brexit scenario. <laughs> you know, you have to be a member before you can leave it. And I would say they were never members, if I'm interpreting it right. Because even the Sona aren't members of the Federation. They were they were just, you know, quote unquote, allies for the duration of the uh, relocation of Baku. Yeah, because the the adults there were familiar with the uniforms and the technology that they brought mm -hmm. with them. And uh, the, apologies, I thought it was implied that they were part of Starfleet at some point in their lives, but because of the planet they live on, that keeps them young and healthy. Mm -hmm. It was a long time before any of the crew that we see there. I think yeah, I've seen yeah, this film um, more times than stuff. that actually justifies. <laughs> I just heard the Picard uh, Admiral Dougherty face off where he says that uh, they have the technology, the planet is inside of our space, that makes us partners in that very sort of we're doing business together type mm. thing. Mm. And if that's why they're working with the soda, because the promise of eternal youth. Um, but of course, there's an enterprise-shaped spanner in the works. Yeah, but again, is that the, it just comes down to that massive plot hole of like just just go there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, another thing about it is when the crew land on the planet, they just start getting really horny as well, <laughs> and it's just. Not necessary. Like we've got a whole subplot where Troy and Riker are trying to, you know, have a bit of time together, and they keep getting interrupted for whatever reason. Even that whole shaving him in the mm -hmm. bathtub scene—it's just you just think, oh, that, that nah, was cring <laughs> cringe-inducing, absolutely cringe-inducing. Bear in mind that Jonathan Frakes also directed this film. Yeah, yeah, it must have been very difficult for him to do that scene. <laughs> I, I reckon that's probably why he does almost nothing in the movie, right? Because, like, Riker's just away from most of it. You know, we mm -hmm. have that little action sequence in the ship, but that's clearly the B-plot. Mm. It's really vague and over with really, really quickly as well. I also find that, okay, so we're going to spike the briar patch. You can't send communications out, so we have to send the Enterprise to the edge of the briar patch to send a message out. On the way, two of two of these horseshoes come in to try and shoot him down. <laughs> and then he comes back. We never actually get to see him send the message or anyone receive the message. So that, that was a whole part that was skipped mm. in the movie. Yeah, well, I guess it's safe to assume that happened. But uh, I think that's probably the only bit of sustained tension if there really was any the shit the battles. Film. Yeah, because yeah, there's actually quite a good hook for this film, and they drop it immediately, which is what's happened to Data. Now, it's worth mm -hmm. mentioning that Doherty, if he didn't ask him for the schematics for Data, which he's got no real reason to ask him for, if he didn't ask him for that, then he would have won. <laughs> like, yeah. he, decided, he decided to endanger his own plan by going, oh yeah, I think I'll ask like our best captain 
uh, if he can give me some information that I've really got no need to know, right? And make a suspicious statement about what happened with his robot. Like, of course he was going to show up there. You know, Picard is a bit of a company man, but he's also got he's also got a good head on his shoulders. You know, he's... Uh, He's he's maybe maybe a bit disenfranchised here. I mean, hell, we see him when he's in the same sort of mood as Kirk, where he's doing diplomacy and a little bit bored, itching to explore. So it's quite a good reason for him to do this. And then, while the hook in itself is quite interesting, again, dropped very quickly, when we do have the sequence where Data comes up in the ship, and we're like, oh, holy heck, holy heck are we about to have uh, Data and Worf Sorry, uh, Picard and Worf being shot at by Data. That'd be quite cool. They start doing the HMS Pinafore song. <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. God, it's painful how long that went well, on for. It was, yeah, Worf's yeah. face said it all. Ah, I, was, that bit, didn't I? I was watching, watching <laughs> with my wife. She's not seen any Star Trek films. And um, that bit comes on. I'm like, the rest of the series isn't like this. <laughs> <laughs> Was, I mean, there's a lot of Rob. goofing around and silliness in this film that, that is almost exemplary of it. Uh, think, and then you've got Data's big floaty head. Yeah, that was a fun bit. The HMS Pinafore, I felt sorry for Worf in that sequence. Picard asks him, do you know Gilbert Sullivan? And Worf goes, I've not had a chance to meet all the new crew members. And it's at their composer's Worf from the 18th century. How is Worf a Klingon? supposed to have known composers from chronologically, what, 400 years in the past? He was like, raised I'd say on Earth, though. He mm. was, but, like, he's also Klingon, and he's very proud of his Klingon heritage. And he was raised in Minsk, which is, I think, now the capital of Belarus. For me, it's an acceptable gap in his knowledge. I suppose they did describe this as a uh, number of uh, Shakespeare being written in the original Klingon. You go, why? So I think it plays fast and loose with, uh, with yeah. what alien species know about Earth, which is bizarre because part of the joys of this franchise is, you know, Worf could go, oh, are they like, and then insert like some Klingon uh, musical theatre people. It'd be great fun. <laughs> or musical theatre Klingons, I should say. Mm-hmm. Now, I reckon with this, most of the crew are relatively underused here, but something that I did thoroughly enjoy, Jim mentioned the horniness earlier. I really enjoyed seeing Picard with the older women there. I thought their scenes together were quite warm, quite nice. We're seeing a different side to Picard than we typically would. And, uh, you know, I felt emotionally vested in that. I know she isn't going to come back for the next one. Mm. and Well, she doesn't, but... I thought that was I thought that was quite nice to see him see him and kind of getting on with a woman like that, and also women who's older as well. You know, they're able to have for sort of long conversations about life and what it could look like, and you know, I suppose that sort of representation of older people falling in love isn't ne- necessarily a particularly uh, popular uh, topic for movies. So, frankly, I thought that was quite cool. I think she is actually whilst her scenes together were good. I do think that she was the sole motivation for Picard to disobey orders, mm. keep the population on the planet. Mm. Yeah, that's probably fair. What do you reckon of her, Jim? Are you a fan? Yeah, I, I liked the dynamic, but it did feel a bit flimsy. You know, they've only, like, I guess you could call it a whirlwind, whirlwind romance. And obviously we've seen in previous uh it was either the films or uh, Best of Both Worlds that uh, Picard's family ties were getting looser. I suppose he'd lost his brother and he didn't have a family of his own. And as we saw earlier, he is getting a bit fed up with diplomacy, etc. It's another film where Picard's gone rogue from Starfleet. Uh, so mm-hmm. it, it is, I guess, I suppose it is nice to see him strike up a relationship that. It, it it didn't feel forced or anything like that either, or shoehorned in. It, it was a more natural development. Mm. But at the end of the day, it just felt like it was just isolated to this particular plot film, what's going on. And, you know, you, you know it's not going anywhere beyond this. So it's just... <laughs> just there. Mm. Yeah, I guess it is also part of the push for a lighter theme, though, as well, saying, all right, can we just do, like, a nice story about Picard falling in love? 
since we've already had him coming to terms with the trauma of being tortured for uh, for a film. And we've also just had the, as you said, relatively heavy uh, Star Trek Generations as well, you know, where he is thinking about his loneliness and what he's really getting out of the position. And then here, there's a bit more of a romantic spin on this with, all right, you're an explorer. You know, this is just for him, it's another uh, it's another bit of fun, basically. It's a it's a way to get out of the office. It's just going down to another planet, solving their disputes, and then musing for a little bit. Like this is kind of him and his element. And I think that's maybe that's that's maybe something that something that makes this film stand out is if there is a love plot to the whole thing, which we don't have in the next one and we didn't have in the previous two. I've got a few things I'd like to sort of things in this film I didn't notice before, but I noticed on this run through. Mm-hmm. Which stuck out. Uh, some of them like a sore thumb, but I suppose you would need to be a Star Trek fan to notice it. So the first one was the start of the film. They've got that delegation of aliens on board. Now their name does escape me. Picard, Riker, and Deanna Troy, they go into the turbo lift. It's Star Trek, so it's not just the lift, it's the turbo lift. And there's little view screens on the back. Uh, on the on the interior wall of the turbo lift that shows you the route through the enterprise that they're taking. They say they're going to deck 10, fair enough. But, and I will say that they timed it well. The route taken on the little view screen lasts for the length of that conversation until the door is open. My issue with it is the geography of the enterprise is completely ass about face. So for instance, at the rear of the ship, you've got the shuttle bay, then it's engineering, then it's deflector control, and then you're up into what they call the saucer section. Mm-hmm. Senior staff quarters are in the top of the saucer section. Deck 10 is just a few stories down from them. In this, they all get into the turbo lift and are at the ass end of the shuttle bay going past the warp core, then up a few stories, and then along. And I'm like, why are they in this part of the ship? What are they doing there? It would make sense for the alien delegation to come from the shuttle bay up to Deck 10, not the senior staff. Anyway, that's just a nitpick. The thing is, if fans notice this sort of stuff, you'd think of people making it would as well. Now, I'm going to do the unthinkable here. I will compliment this film on a couple of things. Firstly, I think the the concept itself... Find in a view, relatively interesting. That's okay. Um, <laughs> second up, the CGI of the ships, the CGI where you've got the slowdown uh, with the uh, older last, that was all quite good as well. And I genuinely thought that the uh, basic story of the Federation being morally compromised was quite interesting, considering we're now uh, nine films into a series. But it's at points to, to idealise them. Those are all cool things, right? Like, in terms of the Federation not coming out of this looking amazing, what do you guys think of that one? Like, did you think the Federation, Federation being compromised was like a yay moment? The idea of the Federation being this pristine utopia and having a dark underbelly has been done before, and it's been done again since. And it's always been done better than this. Um, there's one thing I want to talk about. This is just, just my extended knowledge of the Star Trek uh, universe is that they have a cloaked hollow ship. There was a conflict with the Romulans, who they invented the cloaking device. And in this treaty, it actually forbade the Federation from building the cloaking device. So the fact that they've done that here for the Fountain of Youth is in direct violation of that treaty with the Romulans. This might actually be a hangover from earlier drafts of the script, where the villains were themselves actually supposed to be Romulans, and that they would have assigned uh, the Federation that cloaking device for this purpose. However, during the retooling, the Romulans were taken out, but the cloaking device remained. Same thing technically happened in Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, where the Klingons are piloting a bird of prey, which was previously a Romulan vessel. So if the Federation are willing to anger a neighbouring superpower, Oh, for getting the Fountain of Youth. It shows how far they're actually willing to go to get this mission done. Mm. And it would have had to have been Admiral Doherty himself who greenlit this. Just don't tell don't tell Romulans. 
that we're making this. So that there's there's plenty to go on. That there's there's a lot of rules willing to be broken to get these people off world. The other thing that I thought was quite interesting was we got the um, guy uh, Riffle, where we his physical deterioration is very well done. I thought like mm-hmm. we've got some relatively good body horror going on in there. It's not quite David Cronenberg, but at the same time, like it's Star Trek Nine, right? But at the same time, the kids can watch this as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, I thought it still looked quite strike. It looked, it looked quite mm-hmm. memorable. It was a cool design, and it was also just quite disgusting in a good way. So uh, you know, I, I, I give I give him absolute pod it's fair. Like when we first see him, you know, it's like his uh, skin yeah. in his head's being played with. Like that, I thought was relatively cool. And uh, in terms of an alien species, I assume that they never appear at any, the Sona never appear at any other point of the show, right? They get mentioned but they never no they don't reappear yeah so what, so what we have then is we immediately get an impression of like it's a cool oh, design yeah. it's not just a sort of generic all right um here's someone wearing like blue paper mache or anything like that it was just it, it, it just looked quite unique it looked quite visceral it looked quite uncomfortable that was quite cool the, yeah the design of the aliens was good uh like the you have that sort of yellow horseshoe shape that goes around Ruafo's head. And he says up to this uh, young alien lass, he's going to miss these flesh stretching sessions. <laughs> and you see him getting younger inside of it. But it leads, to, I know it is so cringe, but it leads to what I think is quite an effective scare when Dowerty's face gets put through a window. And then he's slammed down in the same thing and he turns it way up high and it stretches his face out too far. And I will give credit to Jonathan Freight's director here, there's a nice long silent pause after that to sort of like leave you on that note of horror. I, I, I like that. Uh, that. I think that was Raffo's first kill as well. Is uh, Jonathan Freight's done much direction for the show or was this like a directorial debut for him? Yeah, he's uh, directed a lot of episodes of uh, several of the different series. In <laughs> fact, he directed last week's new episode of mm-hmm. Strange New World. Oh, cool. He's done. He's done a lot of direction. We'll get onto this in Nemesis because that wasn't directed by Jonathan Frakes. The reason for that was Insurrection came out that he directed, and he also directed the live action Thunderbirds film. Uh, neither of them did quite as well as the studio was expecting, so they decided to throw in a different director for Star Trek Nemesis, which is why that situation happened that we'll mm-hmm. talk about in the Nemesis section. Okay, so other things we want to chat about here. Uh, data. Right, so we have a rough theme in this. Childhood memories and this idea of uh, he can't empathize, empathize with what it's like to be a child. A child can't empathize with what it's like to be a robot. But what they can both do is it's, it's kind of communicate their experience to each other. Now, uh, maybe I was looking into this with too cynical and crude a mind, but when I heard that Data was going up to the hills following some children, I did. I did laugh. It, does, um, it hasn't aged well. It has that not the film could well. do without that entire subplot. I, that subplot ends with him having a literal roll in the hay with the kids. Right? Like, that was not a good moment. Yeah, um, it was not. But I thought there was maybe something to it because you got like, it wasn't particularly well integrated in the story. But you have this idea of, okay, a fountain of youth, and you've got two directions you follow that. And you either follow that with the idea of a kind of obsession with beauty, which the film did not do. Um, it, well, I, I, I mean, I guess you could say the sona, but the sona aren't really doing it to be beautiful for doing, it, doing that to live longer. Um, the sona, were, they were such lookers. Yeah, like that wasn't vanity that was making them put all those uh, mm. that skin folding on. But... Uh, you've also got the other sort of theme of you go, well, okay, Fountain of Youth, and what, then what about the idea of uh, childhood? And it's like the film had that, like, we will pay lip service to this, but unlike, and I'll save my thoughts on this and this for a little bit, but like with Star Trek Insurrection, it had one very clear theme running through it, which was uh, nature versus nurture, essentially. You know, if you, you know, you uh, live in my shoes, what will happen, and so on. And it felt like Insurrection just didn't really have that. There's also thoughts about mm-hmm. technology. You know, we've got this um, this race ago, we're technologically capable, we just choose not to use it. Now, that was kind of interesting if you ignore the hypocrisy of them using mills, but you're not wearing that, right? Mm-hmm. That, I thought, was okay. 
Although, uh, and I guess also that we have uh, the crew, or at least Picard, goes, oh, a simpler time, simpler life. And they go, oh, we do actually need phasers to protect us. In a way, there's a good cultural exchange there. But at the same time, it just didn't feel like it was adding up to anything substantial. You know, it didn't feel like the film was really about much. It's just here's some other ideas. Things are just being shot at the wall, and we'll see what sticks. And none of it really stuck for me. I mean, maybe I'm missing something here. Do you guys have, like, a particularly good piece of subtext or a theme that jumped out at you? Not particularly. Uh, again, it seems to be continuing Data's Pinocchio arc. Um, mm. You know, just seeing what it's like to be human, what it's like to, you know, play, have fun, that sort of thing. Um I mean, it does play on a couple of similar themes that we see in the previous films as well. You've got Picard going rogue from Starfleet. Mm. Data, although it was a ruse in the previous film, and in this one he is damaged. Uh, again, Data going rogue. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah, as I said at the beginning, it just feels like a glorified episode, although it does have its moments. Like The finale was... A fantastic little switcheroo with the uh, holodeck. Oh, yes, that yeah, was yeah, that was quite fun. Uh, I really, I really like that moment. You just see a flash. It's like, what was that? Oh, never mind. Let's just get on with it. And then, yeah, even we are thinking that they're going ahead with their dastardly scheme, mm -hmm. and then nothing happens. And then it turns out they're not even aboard that uh, space station anymore. And yeah, that, that was a real neat moment. Yeah, I actually thought the finale itself, the finale as a whole was quite well done. Like, it was quite sort of action-y. It was, um, it, we're not really getting the, the diplomat, which is what Picard's known for. We're not really seeing a whole lot of flexibility with how they solve the problem, but we did get a reasonable action quote in. Yeah, and even that uh, final face-off, you would fully expect the baddie to, like, have a little moment of, oh, no, he's going to, you know, overpower Picard for a moment while you know mm. the clock's ticking but we don't get that it's just like you know Picard's like fuck this you're you're dead and mm -hmm. you know he, he just they end up blowing up the uh, space station and Picard manages to get beamed out just in the nick of time mm -hmm. but going going on to that uh, you've got all that blue background uh, is is that it was that uh, a style choice, or did they run out of effects? Oh, did, they for, did they forget to fill in the special effects? <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, there's uh, a lot of blue all around. So that's it, you're right. Question. I uh, didn't think of that. You're right. Time. Yeah, that's a lot of missed special effects. Yeah, I reckon they, they must have been running out of budget quite early on in this. Like, <laughs> do you know what would have saved budget? Getting rid of that little boy's little pet creature thing oh, that kept getting yeah. into trouble. Just get rid of that. Get rid of it, whatever it is. Uh, mid nineties CG. I thought that was okay. Um, something I I think would have been a, made a much better uh, finale is it would have been quite good if we just been like defending the village as opposed to we'll just go through this wander through the uh, landscape. So you have this cool set. We could have done some nice shootouts there or something, or like, or if the enemies are coming, it's almost like the Alamo or something like that. As they all sort of uh, take to their battle stations, there's a bit of tension about the fight. Whereas, while I did appreciate the cinematic part of the uh, Exodus, and as we're seeing this army of extras just wandering around over the hills and stuff like that, it just it felt like we're missing something. It felt like there was a, just a sense of urgency that wasn't quite there. We don't believe here the Sona are going to kill all 600 of them. But at the same time, if they had been in the village, we'd have got this sense of precariousness because we're attached to this village. You know, we've been there for the whole film, basically. And, uh, I, I think that would have been cool. I mean, basically, the lack of tension was just a bit meh. There's also that bit at the beginning with Data's being chased. Now, you're thinking to yourself, what's going on with Data? Who are these guys? The sight of this sort of super modern tech in the village was quite interesting, especially as the villagers didn't know what's was there. But, man, that fight with Data, though, that was so stupid. You get three humans trying to take on what they know is a very powerful android in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Exactly. <laughs> like, uh, I, I get it's still trying to keep it light. You know, maybe it's a bit like, 
we don't want to be showing guns and data here. You know, don't want to be getting the audience all upset. But yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I just sort of thought we had such a cool way into the film, but it just doesn't feel like data's in any danger. It doesn't feel like Picard's in any danger. And then we just land, we go, here's something that's less interesting than the thing you think the film was going to be about. And you go, oh. <laughs> so, and what do you think of the reveal that the, that the uh, Baku and the Sona were actually the same? Uh, it just, it it was neither here nor there. It, it didn't feel like the rug pull it probably was meant to be. And then it just kind of makes the whole thing feel even more stupid because it's just a bunch of stubborn bastards that could quite easily have gone home in the first place. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah, and actually their plan, yeah. their plan was really quite funny. We go, okay, what we're going to do is build a replica of the village in the hollow deck, and then we're going to try and transport them away across with this place. And we go, right, two questions about this. Firstly, why don't you just say sorry? It's easier, right? <laughs> Secondly, um, why not kill them if you're going to go to great lengths there? And thirdly, Picard seems to, at one point, solemnly equate building a replica village, putting 600 people in that, and then flying them away. Here's it to the Holocaust at one point? Like, I thought that was a really strange statement that he made. It's like, no, it's probably exaggerating for effect. Yeah, it's like, it's steady on, mate. Yeah, something you said earlier that reminded me to, prompted me to think of I think one of the issues with the next generation movies and then the TV show, Picard's a diplomat. He can solve issues by talking them through. And he was very adept at that. Unfortunately, this is the antithesis to crashy, smashy, bangy, explosion, fun and excitement. And in this film, I mean, like Picard actually has to fail at diplomacy in all of the movies. The only thing he mm. succeeds at is trying to convince Kirk to come out with a nexus. He couldn't convince Soren to stop firing the missile to blow up a star. He almost failed at convincing Data not to turn to the Borg. And, you know, obviously in this film, mm. he fails to convince Admiral Doherty, someone on his own team, and the Sona at every point. The next film, he's going to fail to convince his own clone not to commit genocide <laughs> so he's Aaron's actually very very bad in the movies whereas but, in the TV show he's very very good at diplomacy but there is a bit where he manages to talk someone out of uh, out of like executing him <laughs> that's <laughs> true dream that's like, true are you sure you want to do this he couldn't turn the room he just changed one mind yes okay I'll give you that one that was a good moment but yes, yeah. that has only happened because of his complete failure of diplomacy elsewhere. In the film. <laughs> yes. Oh, and by the way, right, Dr. Doherty getting killed by the Sona, that was so dissatisfying. Like, surely it would have made more sense for one of two things to happen. Either Picard defeats him, or better, he just gets taken off to the Federation where he's court-martialed. Yeah, but then you wouldn't have got that cool face stretchy bit. That too. And we have to show Ruafo as a villain. He has to kill, he has to kick the dog somewhere, so to speak. Mm, I don't know. It just it, it, struck, it struck me as like he's already kind of established as a villain because he's going, oh, 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 we're just going to carpet bomb with our, uh, with our drones and stuff like this and our big ships. I guess everybody needs a point of no return, don't they? Yeah. Mm. If, if, they're, if there's potential for them being swayed, there's always got to be that bit where. There's no going back from here. I mean, I guess it's yeah. interesting with Doherty. Maybe, yeah, maybe I guess it's interesting that he talks about this in terms of being a mutually beneficial arrangement, but he's talking about this as if he's, like, we're sort of exploiting them. But then it's like, well, as soon as I don't really need you, pal, and they will kill you later on. Like, mm -hmm. I guess it's almost that tragedy of being killed by a monster of his own creation. It's just that we don't really have any reason to like him since he's mm. like him, but he is also undermining our impression of the Federation up until that point. That's why we quite like to see him get his ass kicked. And then he goes, you're going to jail. You know, uh, looks miserable. Oh, maybe the Federation w w won't particularly like uh, all my shenanigans or I don't know. That, 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 that just felt a bit, a bit unsatisfying to me. The other thing is the name. What insurrection are they referring to? 
I think it's Captain Picard just disobeying orders. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So I was sort of thinking it looks it's more like Star Trek coup that we get around Star Trek Insurrection. Like <laughs> I didn't feel like there was really much going on uh to justify the title. Yeah, him because I thought I could be wrong about this. I thought the insurrection was where you over was essentially where you're overthrowing uh government. Oh, then so their their insurrection is against an admiral, but they did he's not overthrown in the classic sense that you create a power vacuum and you then fill that vacuum yourself. They mm. simply create a power vacuum in the ranks of Starfleet. I mean, technically, if, it, if it's an insurrection, it's an unsusuccessful one. Yeah, I, f I think it's just a title that pops, to be fair. Mm. It, it could have been called <laughs> anything, really. Yeah, because uh, uh, just to read a dictionary definition here, if insurrection is an organised and usually violent act of revolt or rebellion against an established government or governing authority. In this case, we don't have that happen at any point in the film. No, I mean, no. I guess the Baku, but the Baku aren't like, there's no enemy within there or anything like that, you know? Uh, it could have been Star Trek revelations. Yeah, so this, is, <laughs> this is what it's like. It's like when, the horror, when, when the horror films just go stick an, an interesting word mm, in, you yeah, know? Yeah, it does feel like that. I mean, I disagree with that order, Admiral, would be a bit of a mouthful for a <laughs> title. Star Trek and the disagreeable orders. If we're embarrassed to use, use number nine in our title, so therefore, mm -hmm. let's just pick a random word, and that's the one we go with. Hey uh, guys, have you guys got anything else you want to say about this movie? It would be comparable to the Marvel films with the Scarlet Witch accent. Is Councillor Troy seems to have a bit of an accent slip across these few films. Oh, she's um, given up. Yeah, <laughs> it seems to be the case that, you know, they're having a little uh, little bit of banter whilst they're on their little uh, refugee hike, I suppose. Yeah. Um, now, have you noticed your boobs are beginning to firm up? There's a question data put to wharf, I believe, after hearing the girls talking about it. It's quite a fun moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just just by that point, you, you can see uh, Diana Troy is not sticking to character from the TV show or the yeah. previous couple of films. She, they're all having a bit more of a laugh in this. I can't remember which one. I think Marina Sirtis said that the premiere of one of these films, she fell asleep during it because <laughs> she found it boring. I'm not, I'm not going to say that Marina Sirtis was checked out in this film. But she's not, she's not putting in the effort she did back when the, the TV show was young, shall we say. Apart from when she gave Riker a shave, I think that was probably, <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, probably the, the way she paid the most attention. Yeah, with the exception probably. of Freddie of 13th Part 9, that was the worst shave I have ever seen on screen. <laughs> smooth, smooth as an android's bottom. <laughs> I will say that when, when Data catches up with Riker and he asks and he just sort of pinches his chin, I quite like that there's that little head shake and they both walk away in opposite directions with a smirk. That that was fun. They're, they're, they are just having fun in this film. Mm. It's almost like you're smoking the bandit style of fun. Um, that Yeah, it's low stakes. We're moving things around and there's, there's nothing. It's inconsequential. It's essentially a lot of this film yeah. is just inconsequential. Um, I want to talk about a bit about uh, the paddle boat. So they drain, I nearly said drain the swamp, they drain the lake and then they see the hollow ship and Date and Picard get onto this little paddle boat but then she, the uh, woman, just joins them. And I think that's why they use the paddle boat because, remember, these guys could just teleport there directly mm. onto the ship. We'll paddle boat so she can come with us. That's the same actress that was Dr. Octopus's wife in Spider-Man 2. Oh, yeah. um, I think she dies. I think she gets glassed in that, if I recall. Mm. I did like right, their, so, their master plan. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but I liked their master plan, plan of doing that. We're like, we'll put this holodeck thing, we'll put it in the water. You go, brilliant. What if it rains or like some water gets splashed <laughs> on it? But anyway, as you're saying. I mean, first of all, remember, this is a bloody spaceship. Why is it not in orbit? Oh, because you would never find it if it was. 
So we, we, the villains have to be stupid, <laughs> really stupid. So we've got this hollow spaceship. Let's stick it in a lake that is adjacent to the village. <laughs> One that they can also drain when they want to. And nullifying the whole cloaking effect by them being able to see the damn thing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> there's also that little mistake of when they get into a gunfight on the hollow village with some Sona lurking around. They, de they deactivate the program, but the Sona that were shot and fell over, are their bodies aren't seen. Which implies that they were also holograms. So <laughs> someone holographed, or someone programmed in some villainous Sona into this program. <laughs> okay, good point, good point. There's also... There's a sequence where you know when you get that tough guy moment, like in the MCU films before Ultron's minions swarm the main cast. They have this in this film, all of the Star Trek with the crew facing off against these drones. It just feels a bit cheesy. Mm. It's not what the franchise is known for. And they're all pulling tough faces. And the, the drones don't try and tag them. The drones line up, wait for the sequence for all the crew to look tough, then start tagging them. Yeah, and prior to that point, just in case you weren't aware, they were setting up transport inhibitors. And the amount of times that that, that word gets said <laughs> between both the, the villains and the crew, you know, if you set up your transport inhibitor, yeah, yes, I'm setting up the transport inhibitor. Oh, you know, yeah. Up on the baddest ship, just in case the audience isn't quite aware of, you know, what this their is plan and what to function. transport the people I off know. the planet. Also reckon right. the anthological, if we say this enough times, people will think that's a real thing. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of repeated dialogue in this film. Darity out, Ruafo saying no in that over-bombastic way, and transport inhibitors. Or the, the logistics of transportation, it, it, it's overly complicated in this film. It really is. And it wasn't the easiest thing to come up with to begin with. Um, so next point I want to get onto is Worf's bazooka. Where did he get that from? And he's used so ineffectively as well. He just knocks a bunch of guys out with it. What's that doing that the phaser rifle isn't? Yeah, that was un that was unintentionally funny. I noticed that. So Picard decides, right, I'm going to break the rules. He takes his captain's pips off, and he's going to beam down to the planet to save them. And then all of the senior staff, ah, uh, we we caught what you were doing, Captain, and we're we're on board with what you're going to do. Does it strike anyone else as strange as some? All of them have already decided to dress in native Baku regalia, except except Riker and Jordi LaForge. And those two just happen to be the ones that Picard assigns to take the Enterprise out of the briar patch to send the signal. It's almost like they knew who Picard was going to assign to do this task. Do you see what I mean? Mm, maybe they just weren't committed. They've dressed accordingly to for instructions they were yet to receive. That that's just that's just something that I noticed this time around. Should we go to star ratings for this one? Sure. What do we think? Jim, what's your star rating for Star Trek Insurrection? Now, despite it being a largely negative discussion, um, I'm gonna give it a free start, because it is a glorified episode, but not a terrible episode. Uh, an entertaining one uh, occasionally drops off, but yeah, it's 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 fine. Um, adequate, I suppose. Uh, Alistair, what about yourself? Are you are you harsher than that? Same. It's uh, it's a three star film, but it's a weak three. Like if there was anything else slightly off about this film, it would have been a two and a half. But it, in terms of being entertaining, you've got. What was it a main cast of seven? They have great chemistry. They all clearly like each other behind the scenes. It's just fun seeing uh, this crew that you grew up with 
enjoying themselves. It's I can't bring myself to hate this film. It, I mean, the story's a bit meh, but it still has its moments. It could have potentially been a four because I did find out the other day that there's a deleted scene with Quark from Deep Space Nine. No, and shut the front uh, door. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I find it hard to imagine how he would be involved considering this is adjacent to the Dominion War going on, isn't it? It's, um, I think it's just before the war kicks off proper. Yeah. Um, so what I was going to say is that there, oh, yeah, there's another point. Worf is here, but obviously Worf is now stationed on Deep Space Nine. Hmm. In this film, they don't even bother explaining why he's here. He's just now on the ship. Hmm. Yeah, because we do that in the next one, which we'll be coming to in just a few minutes. Do explain it there. He's... Worf's present for the wedding, but this time, because when Worf is given the, he's saying why he's here, he actually gets talked over by someone else. So we don't find out why he's here at all. <laughs> See, I reckon this is probably, uh, I guess I don't have the same attachment to the characters as you guys. I think, I usually think this is a three star film. I think it's probably closer to a two, two and a half. The thing is, it has an okay conundrum. But there's absolutely no attempt to for by the crew to debate it. There's no real mm. engagement with here's different approaches we could take. It's just, all right, we don't want to talk about the ethics because we know that it's hard to justify either side's decision. So we had this kind of like tension vacuum running through it where I wasn't particularly on board for the Bakud, I wasn't on board for the Sona either. And I don't really like that position of not rooting for anybody. And I just didn't think that Picard was particularly impressive. <laughs> Basically, there were admirable qualities about the film, and I did think it was okay. I, I thought they, I thought it was it had like a bit of a contagious energy at its best bits. So there's an almost sort of charm to its kind of goofiness. But it just reminded me a bit of Star Trek V, where it just didn't really stand up to a second viewing. The better moments were the crew moments, but at the same time, we didn't really get enough of them. This felt like it was saying, okay, it's Picard's show here and we're going to be doing this kind of like uh, Exodus quest around the planet, but we're not really going to engage with why this is happening. And the only reason that I reckon the uh, Sona don't seem like the villains, sorry, don't, don't, seem like, don't seem like more neutral parties is because they're so obviously the baddies. And that gets kind of undermined later on when you go, all right, well, hey, it turns out we're actually quite good because we're all going to switch sides now we're running out of oxygen. But, yeah, <laughs> make stop... I did make, like that bit. Yeah, and also, the other thing is, if we're going to swap sides, then, all, then that just showed that all we need to do is a bit of diplomacy, and all of this could have been avoided. Basically, I just thought it was... I, I thought it was a uh, mishandling. Diplomacy or asphyxiation, the choice <laughs> is yours. I like your comparison to Star Trek V here, because you have to remember that this, you know, quote-unquote, god entity on a planet that wants a starship, bring it closer. I want to see this starship. It just, it just wants to get off the planet, and it needs a starship to do this. Unfortunately, it wasn't an insurrection planet because the Baku don't want to leave their planet, and the Federation have a ready-made starship to remove the people from the planet. <laughs> it's, we've got the opposite problem in these two films. Okay, so that was Star Trek Insurrection. Now we're going to move on to Star Trek Nemesis. Star Trek Nemesis. Well, the next gen crew sign off with their own version of Wrath of Khan here. Now, I believe that there were further sequels planned for this one, right? But at the same time, it was a bit of a box office flop. Unlike Star Trek Insurrection, which made more money than A Bug's Life and the Enemy of the State, uh, this one, I believe, severely underperformed. I worked at a cinema when this came out. Now, my experience on this will not generalize here, but I recall screenings where only one person was watching it. What is it about this one that we reckon... Like, why didn't they capture the public imagination? Well, I'm going to have to say it, because Insurrection came before it. Mm -hmm. 
I think there's an awfulness, maybe just a human thing, is that the last film you saw colors your impression of that franchise. And Insurrection got, because I think First Contact was a stellar film, well, literally, uh, it was a stellar film that got a lot of people excited about Star Trek again, and they went into Insurrection expecting the same experience. If you go into Insurrection expecting First Contact again, you are going to be disappointed. And I think based on that disappointment is what perhaps failed to bring a lot of fans back for Nemesis. Potentially. Also, this is probably one of the most early 2000s looking films you could uh, choose. Yeah. Uh, starting from the opening credits, you've got the Star Trek Nemesis in a new metal font. Mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> uh, you do and you know we've got that extremely settled on CGI Frank, just interject very quickly if I recall correctly I think another one of those problems for this film was it was released in cinemas and it was up against I think it was the second Harry Potter film and one of the Lord of the Rings uh, so I think it was not released in the cinema at the right time either it was up against mm. really stiff competition Whereas I don't think the previous tracks films were. I guess, uh, actually, if I guess out of that, it's also coming out in 2002, eight years after Next Gen had ended. And I wonder in the days when we're now going, okay, well, we've started Star Wars is back, for instance. As you said, Lord of the Rings is huge, Harry Potter is huge. I wonder if Star Trek just seemed a bit old hat. Anyway, sorry, Jim, as you were saying about the very early noughties yeah, of it. Uh, like, and, and even some of the uh, display equipment you see on the ships. Look just like a DVD menu from <laughs> those areas. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like going off the previous two films, which, you know, both practical and CGI effects were fantastic, re- regardless of the quality of the film. This one just feels like, oh, uh, yeah, this is what we're doing now. So we're just going to go with any old crappy effects. And a lot of the CGI just looked terrible. In it compared to the previous films. Yeah, well, I actually thought the interiors were pretty cool. I thought, I thought like the sets that we had were there was some good attention to detail. I really liked the um, uh, the Romulan uh, Senate building. That was really nice mm-hmm. inside. Um, yep. I quite liked uh, you know Tom Hardy Tom Hardy's ship Shinzon's Shinzon's yeah, ship. Yeah, yeah, that's nice the, the, the scimitar was pretty badass. Really, <laughs> that was uh, a really neat design. But uh, as I say, it's just that whole t- two early 2000s vibe about the overall presentation of the film. I personally, I was quite looking forward to seeing it because when it was released, it was said this was the, you know, the finale of the next gen crew. So I was fully expecting, you know, it to go out with a bang. You know, maybe they're going to kill off Picard or you know one of the other main characters, and it, yeah, anything could happen. But it just kind of felt almost the same pace as the previous film. It just, just, it, like the first, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes of this is quite interesting. You know, mm-hmm. I, you, you, we even get a freaking car chase in a Star Trek film. <laughs> yeah, very clear, clear that, violation of the Prime Directive there. Well, <laughs> all the day, they completely didn't violate that. That, that film very out of place, and they're just doing it for uh, kids and giggles. Yeah, well, I mean, we've, we have already have data singing at the beginning. Uh, we uh, technically had data singing in the previous film as well. Mm. A British tar is a soaring soul. It's free as a mountain bird, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but actually, with data singing... I thought that was quite, quite not to jump straight to the end, but I thought that was quite beautiful at the uh, end. We've got B4 singing the uh, Blue Skies song again as a nice little reprise. I mean, admittedly, I don't want to go straight to the end, but if, if, screw it, I'm already there. It ends in such a downer, you go, Data is dead. Yeah. And, the, and where uh, number six had the uh, Enterprise going, well, we're off for another jaunt. Let's see where our trekking takes us. This goes, yeah, the Enterprise, Stuck in the repair bay, you go. Oh, <laughs> like, just, wasn't that a very inspiring uh, moment? Yeah, yeah. It, it does end on a on a downer, without doubt. 
it's got a notably darker tone for me. That comes along from the uh, just from the intro credits. And also, I guess it's yet another meaningless name, but at least a meaningless name this time uh, implies an element of danger with uh, Nemesis. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, we also do have this sort of idea of almost like a form of restorative justice here, you know, where you go, okay, we've got the Romulans and uh, we don't really have much reason to be rooting for the Romulans here. After all, we know that they've been enslaving the uh, Remans during this one, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we don't really. I don't think. Uh, I imagine this would be different for long-term viewers of the show. I wasn't particularly invested in Vreeman's journey. If I thought they, they seemed a little bit uh, characterless, it's almost quite admirable that you go insurrection, manage to have a uh, a body that was underprivileged when it came to access to healthcare, and we went, oh. And then in this case, you go right. It's an enslaved race, and you're not hugely fussed about it because we don't really know much about them. In fact, actually, I think. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll say this now. I think some one small difference that would have made this a really much better film is you know the the sequence of the beginning where we have the Senate and the, the assassination. Yeah, mm-hmm. if that happened halfway through the film, that would have made it much better. So what you could have had is the tension about is your Shinzen guy. He's presented as a bit of a rebel. Picard's meeting him, trying to suss him out, going, "What's this guy all about?" We know as an audience that he's a villain already when we see this, and we've because we yeah. go two and two together, the assassinations have happened, we've had this needless trip to the desert planet, which we'll come to later on. Oh um, my god, this yeah. Plot, this silly plot point with B4, which is clearly there to bring them to uh to Shinzen, and then and then he's going, I might not actually be a villain, I believe in peace. And you want to believe him because you want the film to be more morally ambiguous and interesting than it is. But if what we'd had is uh, him blowing up the Senate halfway through is like a moment of triumph. And then Picard goes, I was wrong to trust him. I trust him because he was a clone of me, essentially. I think that would have been a much better movie. Don't trust yourself. Exactly. Right? Uh, like, it would have been the equivalent. I appreciate it's just not necessarily a great film to compare it to, but we've been the equivalent of in uh, Batman versus Superman, right? You know, where you've got that nice moment of the bomb going off halfway through the film, right? And I think, I mean, obviously we know that Lex Luthor's a villain, but at the same time, that created quite a nice spectacle for the midway. And uh, here we just had this big second act slowdown because we're waiting for Picard, who's written as a very smart character, to figure out the thing that yeah. we, the audience, have already figured out. That's true. That's uh, Your assessment seems correct. Because did you guys like Shinzen as a baddie? Peaks and troughs. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it, it was a like our introduction was pretty good. I, I guess his statue seemed a little underwhelming considering the film's title. Like he's just some scrawny little kid, <laughs> essentially. Oh god, it was weird seeing Tom Hardy's face on him. It almost looked CG yeah. just because I'm not used to seeing that <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's uh, definitely a bit more built these days, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Um but th- yeah, there were times where you do start to think there is a yeah, a, a, a nice side to this character. Like we get his backstory, which you know, when he's talking about it, we have that little flashback, and we see those lovely opulent sci-fi vistas of Remus. Yeah. Um, so we get all that backstory. You know, a bit of empathy towards his upbringing. Um, I, I like the idea that there is a clone of Picard for him to one day. Like take his place and somehow infiltrate Starfleet. That that's a pretty daft but fun idea. But for it to be a defective clone because of the potentially degenerative illness that he had as a kid, that there is that uh, level of sympathy towards it. But the fact that he just ends up becoming a genocidal maniac. He, he, yeah, you, know, you just don't care by that point. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. He, he becomes a genocidal maniac in a way that makes no sense. So he's been mistreated. He was created by the Romulans to suit an agenda. They didn't care about him, only what he could have done for them. He then, instead of them going through with that, they throw him onto Remus. Right, here you go. Dilithium crystals. Here's your pickaxe. Chop to it. And he was basically brutalized as a kid, befriended Remans. He should hate the Romulans. 
you should hate the Romulans. And it's shown throughout the film he does hate the Romulans. But instead of killing even more Romulans than he does at the Senate, he's like, I'm going to go and defeat the Federation, <laughs> the the arch nemesis of the, I use the title of the film, the arch nemesis of the Romulan Star Empire. I'm going to go defeat their enemy for them. Why? Yeah. Would you do that? That was a daft plot. Uh, I, I think that was when, due to a different term from existential plot, where we had like this uh, <laughs> very, very, this very, very heavy civilizational threat for no real reason. Like, you're going to have with a baddie like that, especially with a conflict's personalized like it is in Rafakan, which is more of a passing resemblance to you want to have it where the baddie, ha- baddie has to believe for the good guy in their own head, so the motivation has to make sense. You're right. Him saying, I want to take my own back on the Romulans does make sense. Him going, I hate the Federation, just doesn't make any sense. I, I, yeah, it was, a, it was a bit of a missed opportunity, actually, because the, the whole Picard clone concept was really, really stupid. But at the same time, I liked that I liked him to do the nature versus nurture stuff. And I always say this as a fan of the show, with the clone idea being stupid. The Romulans were, in the next generation TV show, the Romulans were technically your main villain. They had supplanted the Klingons from Kirk's original series. And the Romulans were always up to something. And a clone of Picard... It, it actually is exactly what the TNG era Romulans would do. Uh, fair enough. It just it felt a little bit convoluted for what <laughs> for, for, for what all of their to all of their for. bloody plans are convoluted. <laughs> I'll give you a very quick example. There's an episode where they capture Jordi LaForge, send her a placement on his behalf to the pleasure planet Risa, because he's his own holiday, and they fix his visor mm-hmm. so that uh, he goes back to the Enterprise and he tries to assassinate a Klingon ambassador Mm -hmm. to weaken the ties between the Federation and the Klingon Empire so that uh, the Romulan Empire has a bit more, can throw its weight around a bit more in the quadrant because (laughs) the alliance between the Federation and Klingons sort of box the Romulans into a corner. You see, I mean, I I, I do mean all of their plans are convoluted this way. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. I'll have a slide. It's in character. It, 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 the, the clone of Picard, I'm like, sold. Uh, 90s Romulans, that's exactly what they'd do. But something I really want to compliment Tom Hardy on. Tom Hardy has, of course, uh, gone on to be a very good actor. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. something I respected about his performance here is he's not just doing an imitation of Patrick Stewart. Like, he, he, do, he isn't trying to ape his mannerisms or anything. It's not that kind of performance. He's basically scenery chewing. He's doing an incredibly kind of camp villain. He's obviously mm-hmm. having a bit of fun with it. And I thought it was quite delightful to watch at the best points. I think he elevated the material uh, quite substantially. Um, I don't think it was a great film, but at the same time, I thought that he was very watchable in it. Yes. Mm, yeah, I think he did a good job because he's he's not going to be exactly the same as Picard, is he? Considering the circumstances of his upbringing mm. and how he got to where he is at this point. So, yeah, they're going to be two completely different people, Mm personality-wise. I did think Mm -hmm. that the uh, messages, or at least the thematic meat, was a little bit heavy-handed. You know, and I think, again, that would have been more interesting if they were having their big conversation in the Senate before the assassination. So we don't know, is he going to go ahead with it? Whereas afterwards we go, this is just padding. We know he's a villain here. And, the, you know, for all the talk of, well, if you'd live my life, etc., we go, well, he's already done the thing that we're not going to forgive him for. And we already know that Picard is, like, basically the most honourable captain of them all. So yeah. in that respect, he's the, the parallel it's going for as a dramatic foil just isn't quite there. I'll tell you why I think it is because the guys that wrote this film are the same guys that wrote the scripts for the TV show. As as I'm sure you're aware, Leonard Nimoy directed a couple of the Star Trek movies, Mm. and he was approached with a couple of directing some of the next-gen movies, and then they went to 
Jonathan Frakes instead. And one of Nimoy's sticking points is that you need to redo the script. This isn't the TV show, this is the movie. And it's a very different animal. And a lot of the next-gen movies, they do feel like they're made for TV movies. And here's one of the points, right? So if you stick on an episode of Star Trek, it'll start with something called the teaser, basically that encompasses the inciting incident, opening credits, and then what's then demarcating acts one, two, three are your ad breaks. That whole assassination at the beginning, that is the teaser. Mm, that would have been in a yes, TV show. Yeah. Now, I would have, now that you've brought this up, because I haven't thought about this before, actually, but I think it would have been a really good idea if he captures Picard, steals the information from the Enterprise, and assassinates the Senate all at once. Like, that is your big flip, and mm. including that attack right there. That should have all happened at the same time, and that would have been big, memorable. The story now gets going. Um, the, but you see what I mean? You see why they yeah, structured it that way? But you don't need a teaser for the movie. Yeah, because that, that would have been quite cool if he managed, managed to do that, because we would have assumed the Romulans are going to be the bad guys, because as you said earlier, for the baddies in the series, right? Yeah. So then you go, okay, well, twist, they're not. This rebel guy who you've been invested in as being a being like a potential force of force for peace, he's actually the villain. And uh, now Picard's asked all sorts of questions about if he could have done that himself on the grounds that he trusted this guy because the guy is him. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, that would have been a much that would have been a much better movie. Um Whereas the first act of this is just kind of a little bit, uh, a little bit like kind of meandering. Uh, we start off with the wedding. Now the wedding, literally, they're just meandering in a buggy. <laughs> now the wedding has the single worst best man speech that's ever been put to film, which is a series of Picard's boasts about his own achievements. <laughs> like what an absolute dick. If I sort of warmed to it this time around, on the proviso that. He's not reading this out to a bunch of strangers. He's reading it out to a group of friends. And he does... There, there is that part where, if you don't find it funny, he looks like an asshole. But after, let's say, the asshole segment of the speech is out of the way, he he, he calls Riker his... He's been my right arm for, for over a decade, and Deanna Troy's been my conscience. And that part from the heart I, I worked not the entire speech like I've made first contact with 27 new races I mean that's a bit like somebody who's won 27 Oscars shouting out to a room full of people who haven't even won one yes exactly, exactly. What they what they're so yeah there's there is dickheadedness in this speech but at least uh, he's trying to be funny but it, he it does end on a solemn note, so I didn't mind it as much this time around. I reckon what we're going for there was saying there might be new people in the audience who've never seen a Star Trek before. Info so, dump. Yeah, how do we do the info dump where he just outlines <laughs> the, the various reasons speech. he's quite good? And they're like, yeah, exactly. An inappropriate thing. Like, I'm just trying to imagine. Um, so my best man was my uh, was my brother. If my brother had began his speech by going. Let me tell you about about my job. Even if people knew him, if, if, if everyone knew him and we worked for the same company for some reason, right? Uh-huh. If In that setup, oh, and for some reason he's my boss as well, right? I would have been raging. Like, if you're yeah. a Riker, he's just going, he's made the speech all about him. He's going like, have you thought about how this uh-huh. will impact me, right? And the audience is meant to go, oh, he's skewing himself. You go, no, the best man's supposed to make fun of the... Uh, well, the groom, right? Like, it doesn't work on a fundamental level. I think you're right, though, that using that as a platform to info dump is why they did it that way. Yeah, that was yeah. terrible. What did you reckon, Jim? Did your best man do a speech for sending like that? Um, oh, God, I'll, I'll get into trouble if I say I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it was my brother, so if he was to talk about work whilst he was giving my best man speech, I would have probably zoned out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it, it's. I think it served its purpose, as you say. It's you know there as a as a setup for people who aren't familiar, and and it was a 
more of an in jokey sort of thing as well. But I, I just thought it was a nice little excuse to get some of the TV crew on the film mm. as well. Uh, as we see, see for the, one. Uh, yep. yeah, uh, Wesley Crusher is there as well. That's his first appearance in the films. Um, yeah, obviously only. this is yeah, it's it's the uh, last film for that particular crew. So that uh, was a nice little nod. He's the uh, Where's Wally of the uh, Star Trek <laughs> casting crew. Hey, we have a few nice cameos here because we've also got uh, Janeway appearing. We've got uh, Whoopi mm-hmm. Goldberg is back for the uh, for the wedding. Oh, Guinan, yes, I don't, yeah. yeah. So, uh, aye, uh, like like the wedding bit itself was relatively joyous. Um, and you know, for, yeah, the speech the speech was goofy. I hope at some point, somewhere, somebody's been married, and as a tribute to Star Trek Nemesis. Somebody has done that speech, and most of the room have been confused. I hope that's happened. <laughs> we go from this to the uh, the next big bit is the desert planet part. Now, I got a thing to say about this. Yeah, what was your what's your thing about this one? In my notes, I wrote down "dummy wharf." <laughs> now it's 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 so obvious when they're driving along and it's close up. You see, all the actors are there. But you see how, like, Michael Dorn in the back seat, how he wobbles to the side uh, to and fro with the unevenness of the desert. Mm. When it's a long shot from a distance, it's clearly a dummy that's locked in position and it wobbles back and forth. Like, it's just, it's so fake. This is a mannequin that they're stuck in at the back seat. This whole thing with B4... Could you, could, the film could function without this entire bit, right? Like, the only reason that the, this subplot is put in this film is we can kill Data in the end, but not really kill him. Yeah, it's, it's kind of the Spock thing where he gets a new body regenerated of the Genesis planet and his Catra is in Dr. McCoy. This is... Uh, Data's duplicated his memories and he got B4's body right there. Yeah. That's your get yeah, out of jail free card. You've got the whole integration bit after they uh after they've done the uh scavenger hunt for all his limbs and uh, other parts. The fact that they're on this planet where they literally risk their lives to find all these parts, uh which uh you know, the the climax of which they drive off a cliff into the back of the (laughs) shuttle. Yeah. Um, And then after going through all of that, they're immediately like, oh, yeah, let's just link data up with him. You know, they can integrate. It'll be fine. I'm not even a member of this crew, and I'm thinking this is a bad idea. Well, (laughs) it's an even worse idea from the series. uh, Data has an evil twin brother called Lore. That makes sense. So this is an even worse idea than you think. Yeah, because... (laughs) The things I get if they're trying to do the parallel of, all right, so you got Picard and the Picard clone, you go, this doesn't work as a as a comparison here because B4 is introduced as being lower tech than data. Like if it's an evil data, just use that. Ah. Uh. They could have done it because the last appearance of Lore was in the two parter descent. And at the end of it, he's simply deactivated. The body's still there. Federation still have him somewhere. Uh, yeah, that's the yes. body. I mean, I suppose maybe. <laughs> what do you mean before? Yeah, I mean, I suppose maybe what we're going with is uh, perhaps we're meant to go. All right, Data's able to reflect on how much he on how different he is, how much more advanced he is than before, and that's like, oh, I don't need to be human because I am different. The thing is. It's not differences that he himself has made, it's differences in how he's built. So that, as a parallel, doesn't really work. I guess if there's a message to this film, the main one is, you know, the main thing about humanity is humanity can adapt, right? That, we're not, that we don't necessarily have these fixed behaviours that we can grow with experience. It's almost like erecting this sort of genetic determinism straw man and then going, but that's not the case. You go, most people don't think that's the case, pal. But anyway... The thing is, that seems to be what the film's trying to do, but it doesn't work if Data is fundamentally different tech than B4. What would have actually been interesting, though, is if Data had taught B4 about sacrifice and B4 had sacrificed himself, then that would have been far more thematically coherent of the rest of the movie. It does parallel the 
Shinzon Picard story. Well, not really, but I think it was meant to. But uh, it's more a device to bring data back in a in a later film than it is to you know have these two equivalent storylines mirroring each other throughout. Yeah, I, w- I was fully expecting it to have done like a switcheroo uh, towards the end where Data's having his uh, Spock moment of you know being the only person they're capable of saving everyone but at the expense of his own life and i was fully expecting him to get back on the enterprise and oh, i'm the real data actually but mm. yeah it's, I, I guess that's just uh well they didn't do the switcheroo on the on the scimitar they beam mm, over yeah, data yeah. but they they think they're beaming over b4 it's actually data who helps picard escape i will say actually one thing with the b4 plot uh brett spinder got to do some pretty good work he played both parts well, and I thought during the deactivation sequence in particular, that was a really nice performance. Very, mm-hmm. very sorrowful as he's doing this, you know, he, but on both sides of the equation. B4 almost slightly scared about what's about to happen. Data mm. clearly not having great fun doing it either. Yeah. You know, that, like, I think Brett Spinder, if he's coming into this again as someone who's in, he's not that familiar with the character of Data, uh, I think he's consistently... Uh, outperforms the material he's been given during these films. Uh, this is absolutely no exception. No, not at all. Plus, they let him sing, so that's probably why. <laughs> <laughs> it was written into the contract. So, as far as the, as Picard's diplomacy goes, we don't really, again, we don't really have any success in diplomacy here. But I do like that, even though we ultim- ultimately know that this is a fruitless negotiation here, because Shinzen's going to be going go on to be a bad guy. At the same time, I like that we do have clear empathy on Picard's part here. He does sympathize with the reasoning here. He also has this sort of urge for peace, and he wants to believe, essentially. And I thought that was quite nice. But at the same time, well, yeah, we don't get Picard. We get Picard the action hero again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if if it did end with a nice diplomatic solution, they wouldn't end up shoving the Enterprise up his ass, would they? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's uh, a film, so they've got to go with a big bombastic ending mm. instead. Actually, what, what about the action sequences? Overall, I thought they looked pretty cool. The um, we talked about the June buggy sequence earlier. Uh, whilst it didn't really belong in a Star Trek film, it was still relatively exciting. The corridor shootouts I thought were pretty good as well. I mean, it looked quite good fast editing. I want to go back to quickly to the the Dune buggy sequence, and uh, I found the action, the Dune buggy action, out of place. But the tone when they first find the arm and the other bits of the body, there's a sort of foreboding sense of dread, and like Picard says, something's not right. That tone was quite effective. I liked that. And I think that was actually the best bit out of the entire Dune buggy sequence. Um, what are your guys' thought? We'll have to talk about it at some point. The Deanna Troy mind rape sequence. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Because <laughs> bearing in mind, that, and, and this is a bit that put me off Picard, actually, is that he denies her request to be relieved of duty. But she, he asks her to, if she can endure more of these psychic attacks. Bear in mind, she's supposed to be on her honeymoon yeah. with her husband. Instead, she's on the Enterprise being asked to endure multiple mind rape scenarios. Yeah, that when makes the tall curl. Yeah. 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 They were told a couple of times that they were going to be dropped off you know, en route to where they were going, but that, that never happens. And then <laughs> whilst they're trying to enjoy their time, that happens. And yeah, I mean, it was getting a bit too close to the knuckle as it was with that whole bedroom scene. Because, you know, Riker at this point is prolific and you're thinking, oh, God, are they really going the whole hog this time? <laughs> <laughs> We've um, upgraded from the bathtub to the bedroom. I didn't even thought about that, actually, but yeah, as a honeymoon, this is a, it's a pretty bad one. Um, the mind rate <laughs> bit, so... I know by reputation this happens quite a few times in the in the, in the show. Yeah, and it's always Deanna Troy as well. Something I did uh, like about how they handled it, though, 
in terms of the because you one could question whether it should be there at all, but in terms of the aftermath, I like that she was able to use this connection again to identify where the ship is that could not otherwise be detected. Mm-hmm. So that was nice to to include her in the uh, kind of confrontation. I was wondering why, as the counselor, it was her that like moves the ship forward. Like, is that normal? Oh, she had okay. Um, the front view screen, like the Enterprise, takes a few torpedo hits, and the front view screen gets blown out. Do you remember when the people were all blown out into space? Yeah, yeah. So the force field comes up to protect the crew inside, and the Enterprise just assumes one of their posts. Yeah, I just thought that was quite. It's just quite <laughs> funny. You go, she's the counselor. And she's like, all right, I'll, I'll go to this. You go, I'm, like absolutely, and absolutely no criticism of counselors here. But I was like, how easy is the spaceship? <laughs> Why, if you don't, if you don't require experience? This is the second Enterprise that Diana Troy has crashed. Do you remember <laughs> who was at the helm when a saucer second landed on Viridian Three? Ah, uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it wouldn't be the first replacement helmsman either. Like in the TV show, pretty much every time there's some form of conflict. The person at the helm is one of the first to be injured, <laughs> yeah. and someone quickly takes their place. Very interchangeable. Uh, by, by the way, I think something interesting about the director of this. The director of Star Trek Nemesis was also the director of the hit movie U.S. Marshals. That film was quality. You guys are like we don't we don't like U.S. Marshals. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> good. I think so. depending on your caliber as a director, I don't think you always get to. Uh pick and choose the scripts that come your way. I like to think we used to do US Marshals and they were watching that going, all right, so what we want to do is get someone who works on the film like a fugitive, but we don't have have enough money. They went, US Marshals. <laughs> but yeah, so in terms of other good things within this uh, movie, I thought the fight at the end was actually pretty cool. It was hugely anticlimactic when he's going, all right, here's a big metal spike through the chest. <laughs> and uh, then as he's uh, dying, he's saying, saying but it's good, just, we can spend this time together or whatever. Which, uh, But at the same time, like the uh, fight to get there was pretty cool. And again, it looked, it looked good. It, it looked cinematic in a way that Insurrection didn't. Yes. Yeah, I'll definitely give you that. It, the action has, was superior to Insurrection. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I had checked out by this point. <laughs> I was just willing it to end. Um, that, that's not to say it wasn't engaging for the most part, but it, it just felt like this whole finale went on far too long. It wasn't a particularly plot-heavy film after the first uh, after the first act, really. Like they did quite a bit of uh, lore that I guess long-term fans would have known, and maybe like new fans who've been playing a bit of catch-up. But I don't think there was really a whole a, that that much story to really engage with, and it was, mm. despite that, it was relatively talky for large parts. So I think the pace maybe a bit of the ebb and flow to it. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole infiltration part where Data's uh, pretending to escort the captain through the corridors and everything whilst they're trying to escape that was good. But yeah, just from that point, it just seemed to run out of steam, and then yeah. It's, Zoned up for me. <laughs> I, I did like the preparation for the battle sequence. So that was quite somber again. Like when we're watching Best of Both Worlds, there was a sense of this could go wrong. Because it essentially contrived an awkward situation where they go, We're going to blow up Earth, but first we need to abduct Picard. You go, Oh, I know that, like, I know that he's got to do it because he needs his DNA. Although this is necessitating that he can't blow up the Enterprise because he has to get Picard alive which takes away some of the tension. And also we know that he's not going straight for Earth, which takes away more of the tension. But despite that, again, I still thought it looked quite cool. In terms of other things that didn't really work too well about uh, about this, how the hell did Shinzen get B4 uh, onto the planet? Didn't work for me. Oh, complete mystery. <laughs> I mean, the, we know from the show that Romulans have their spies inside the Federation. How bloody good are these spies when they're finding an android that the Federation themselves don't know about? Mm. That's because the, the, the pause, like the thing about data is the guy that made him is a genius, and nobody else has been able to replicate that technology. So you think people would already have known about this? Is why they just should have used Laura's bloody body. 
to yeah, define. I think they dropped him from orbit, and that's why they had to go on that scavenger hunt for all his parts. Is this a joke about being dropped as a baby? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's very elaborate to split him into sections. Yeah, very, yeah. send them on a quest around the desert. Yeah, to as what, put together. what if any of his ship had gone? Oh, we've got the thing. We, we've got the reading. Let's go there. Yeah. Go, go, go. I know. Oh. Well, that's what they go. What the heck's this robot? Who cares? But then it's it's explained that they they wanted to lure the Enterprise there, so that the Enterprise would then be the closest ship to Romulus for the negotiation. Mm. Could they not have just asked for the Enterprise to? Because remember, this is the flagship, and Picard is famous for his, if not infamous, for his diplomacy. Yeah. There's a strong chance that this would be the ship the Federation would actually send anyway. Yeah, yeah there's I mean, a lot of redundant plot points here. And especially if he had gone with what we were saying as the, be- as the sort of better structure for the movie as well, and it would have made sense to go, we need our best people to go and see if this guy seems legit or not. Still, that would be your flagship. Something, yeah, something I will say though about the as much as I think the introduction, the, this cold opener didn't need to be there. Going from the Senate, this quite hideous death sequence to a wedding, it's quite a nice contrast. <laughs> Picard's speech is so bad, people are turning to dust. <laughs> there were some other like, nice little moments of uh, of humor. The CGI teacup, for instance, <laughs> Shins and Yuzis, I thought was quite neat. But overall, tonally, it was the most mature of the next gen films, I would say. Yeah, well, if, if not the darkest. Uh, yeah, it's the darkest. I did think a personalized conflict was good again, even if there was, wasn't really enough moral ambiguity since he's going, we'll kill the Federation for no reason and George and no one for bad you when you meet me. At the same time, it did mean that like Picard seemed sort of emotionally challenged by the whole thing. But it did mean that a lot of the rest of the crew just felt a little bit underused. Because I think something that on none of these films have really done is, um, maybe this is an episode thing versus writing for movies. But it strikes me as if you're writing a movie like this, to make a comparison to something like The Avengers or anything we've got, mm-hmm. or like Guardians of the Galaxy, actually, is probably a better example of, you know, if you've got crew difficulties, you use a film to explore one aspect of that tension, right? Like, okay, maybe people feel underappreciated or something, or, okay, the tension for this one is... Uh, the crew, the crew need to get a better work-life balance, something along those lines, whereas it just feels like all of these are trying to give everyone a separate, small thing, and the films don't really feel like they're really about much. In this case, it's a nature versus nurture one, but at the same time, it's not really reflected in half, in half the little storylines. You know, it just feels like there wasn't really a coherent set of themes running through it, and I would have liked to have seen a more connective tissue about the kind of personalities on this ship and uh, how the crew's getting on, where, it's, where it is emotionally, that sort of thing. Yeah, I guess that's the problem when you're translating a 24-episode TV show to a two-hour film. You know, it, most of the TV show episodes would focus on a different member of the crew having their own mm-hmm. issues. You get a Riker episode, so, a day episode, yeah. a Crusher episode, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, here just didn't quite have that. I, th- I think because you're then translating that cast, which works for the TV show, into what would actually be quite a bloated cast for a movie. Yes, Because you have to have the cast, and you have to give them all things to do, but you can't say this is the hero's journey, this is the father mm. or the, the friend. Yeah, because so, some episodes, like, y- you might get Chief O'Brien being mm-hmm. the, the focus of the attention in the next episode. It'll just His involvement will be a little nod in the transporter room. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, I guess it's difficult to translate that to a two-hour film mm-hmm. when you've got several series of, you know, 45-minute episodes. The thing is, well, this isn't a problem that the earlier films had. I actually thought the original, original crew films did mostly work as films. Or at least they were, they were uh, even the bad ones were structured quite convincingly like films. 
Like, you know, I mean, um, you know, say what say what one wants about Star Trek V, but Star Trek V still had had coherent themes running through the whole thing. Star Trek V was able to explore this idea of uh, three old friends on uh, on shore leave and their sort of frenemy relationship they developed with each other. And that gave it that, again, that, is, that feeling of just being a, a singular piece of work as opposed mm-hmm. to just here's I just said an episode of the show where you go, here's the A plot, the B plot, the C plot. Yeah, I think by the time, obviously we're going off the trail a bit here, but I think by the time we get to Star Trek V, we've got this firmly established trio of main characters and this friendship. And we do get Uhura's fan dance as well. <laughs> here's, a, here's a point, and I could be wrong in this, but you get the big three in the original Star Trek, Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and then you got your uh, intermediate crew members after that, and then there's the ones that appear for one or two episodes. So you got a cast of around about seven, and with Star Trek The Next Generation, there never really was a power three, sort of Picard, and if we can, I mean, the movies turned into the Picard and Data show, because it's just those two that get any any meat anything to do in the movies the power two the rest yeah. have the rest are just sort of stuck for conversation they have nothing to do it's surprising because Riker uh, just strikes me as like he 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 he's kind of under underused in all of these yeah he is and I give you I give he's directing one of them actually as far as this one goes I know that he he didn't he didn't direct it partially largely because of what you're saying about Thunderbirds film but do you know if he was planning on doing it? Because I'm wondering, like, if it was written for a film that he would direct to explain why he's barely in it. Probably. I would suggest, I, I would say it was sort of written with him in mind as director mm. until the films didn't quite hit their targets at the box office. That being said, I thought he had a decent enough presence in First Contact. Uh, he directed that one as well, and he, he was quite present for a lot of the earthbound scenes so mm. I, I guess maybe as the films went on he wanted to concentrate more behind the camera than in front of it and I guess having him in a diminished role as a character would allow the other crew to have more of a prominent yeah. position but yeah uh, I, I guess it's just finding a balance of who gets the yeah. meat and you know, of the script it, and so on. It but does feel like as the movies go on that Picard and Data just chew up more yeah. and more of the dialogue yeah, they, 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 they feel like the Kirk and Spock of this generation of crew, and we just don't have a bones. Uh, no bones about it. <laughs> of course, with this, we um, we have a heroic sacrifice but then due to MacGuffin that was introduced earlier in the film, a few minutes later, we have that character returning. God, I wonder if that happens again. Surely J.J. Abrams won't make the same mistake. But we'll be coming to those ones uh, later on. Can I say very quickly about that last moment of this film where Data comes in to save Picard and the actors are working with absolute straw. The... <laughs> This is the final moments that this data will ever be with Picard. It's like in season eight of Game of Thrones, where Jon Snow is about to tell his sisters that he is a Targaryen. And instead of us seeing that conversation, seeing the sisters react, we cut away to something else. It's almost Mm. like uh, the writers of the show knew they weren't going to be able to execute the scene well, but instead of having the bravery to try and do it anyway, they just shied away from it and tried to walk around it. Mm. I feel like they did the same thing here. He puts the mobile transporter onto Picard. Picard zips away before he says anything. He's about to say something. Transports away. He says, goodbye, old friend. And it, it's just, it's a wet sock. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is not the scene that we want to feast on to get the feels and the emotions. There's just nothing there. These two characters, after 15 years and one sacrificing himself to save the other, what a let. I think this might be one of the reasons why 
I'm so cold to the film as well because, as I've said before, this this should have been the big send off for this crew. It should have been dramatic. It should have been emotional. But there was just yeah, it was just squib. <laughs> yeah, squib is a perfect word to describe this one. How many stars are you going to give this squib, Jim? I'm going to go with two. But it's it's not completely terrible. <laughs> but it's definitely <laughs> it's definitely the worst of the Star Trek franchise films. Uh, Alistair, what do you reckon? Oh, two and a half. I do remember when I went to the cinema to see this, and I did see this at the cinema. I wanted to like it more than I did. It's also, the Romulans were always my favourite villains, and this was going to be their first big screen outing. And that was disappointing as well. It, it just doesn't tick all the boxes that it should have ticked and especially in hindsight when you find out that this is actually the farewell film then it then it definitely underperforms and you're comparing this to the last send-off movie which was the undiscovered country well i don't know why they don't just give all of their star trek films to nicholas mayer to do but mm. he just routinely churns out great star trek films the thing that annoys me about this film as well is that there's heaps of potential it's just squandered. Yeah, because you go, it's got, we mentioned the visuals were a bit crap, but you know what? It's got, they've got access to technology they didn't have at other points in the series. Yeah. They have a good cast. You have Tom Hardy there. They have a reasonable concept, in as much as you go, all right, it's a uh, Picard clone, and uh, it's going to be a personalized conflict again, and that's cool. As if Romulans are coming in. So you have the makings of something there. I reckon this is probably about a two and a half star film. Um, whether it's better than Insurrection or not, I'll come up with that next week. But at the same time, or next week, in the next Star Trek episode, which will not mm-hmm. not come out next week. But at the same time, um, <laughs> being this journey's taken us a year and we thought this would be finished by January, <laughs> uh, this is definitely not coming out next week. But anyway, point is, it has good things going for it and it just feels like a waste of potential basically yeah i think uh, about two and a half star film and uh you know it's an unfortunate ending considering how well number six ended and yeah. you know that, that did have that feeling of finality now i guess this one wasn't necessarily supposed to be the last one so it almost becomes kind of worse in retrospect because it was <laughs> a bit like if um if the original series had just ended on uh, part five or something like that, you know? I I guess, actually, you can compare it to part seven, but part seven was also the end of the original cast. In fact, they even killed uh, Kirk in part seven, which is more of a dick move than anything that we have had in the year of killing Data. But at the same time, two and a half star, approximately. We need to talk about how this film, almost beat for beat, follows the Wrath of Khan. It does a bit, yeah. What do you say the main comparisons for this one are? Well, the fight in the nebula, mm-hmm. the personalised villain in that sense, the fact that we're going to kill off a character and we're going to set up mm. bringing them back potentially in a later non-existent film. Yeah. The the way that the Enterprise is lured into position of the villain wants it to be lured into. There's a lot of plot beats that we're following. The Wrath of Khan and it's just not the same. It's almost the voice has certainly triumphed over the echo in this sense. From that uh, lovely poetic image, let us move on to our list. list time. Today's list is going to be all about science fiction shows from the 1990s. Now that means they either started or ended in the 1990s. They cover a range of different types of sci-fi, if not all space opera or anything like that. But one thing they have in common is they aren't Star Trek. And that is because, hey, this, is, this might well be a Star Trek spin-off show, but we like other science fiction, right guys? So take a few moments. What are your immediate ones that jump out? I will say this is not in any order, and this is through ScreenRant.com. I'm going to start off by saying Space Precinct. 
Oh, oh, oh forgot about oh, that one. Um, <laughs> the Thunderbirds, live action Thunderbirds. Neither of those are on it, but I do remember <sighs> Space Precinct, the do 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 theme. God, I, that I was remember. Good. Yeah. Takes me back. I remember having even having pogs of <laughs> Space Precinct. That's <laughs> Space Precinct is not on the list. That's a shit. It should be. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Babylon Five. Babylon Five is on the list. Yeah, I, I knew that was going to be on there. I thought I'd leave that one for you, Alistair. Um, no probs. If we're not uh, stuck to the space theme, I'm going to go with Quantum Leap. Yes, Quantum Leap is on there as well. Oh, would uh, Sequest DSV be on there as well? It is, yeah. So I'm not familiar with Sequest DSV. What, what's, Sequest, what's Sequest DSV all about? A submarine. The, only reason, yeah, <laughs> the only reason you'd watch it is because it's got the guy from Jaws in it. And <laughs> I believe Roy Mark Hamill well. had a guest appearance. I was yeah. well buzzed the day I saw that episode, but the only thing I remember from it was a talking dolphin. So <laughs> Wait, yeah, this, is just, right. this is just what it sounds like. It's about a submarine crew just going around. and like Exploring the... It's... Yeah, it's Star Trek underwater. Uh, uh, do they, so, do they find like lots of like mer people and stuff? Like, I'm just wondering how they come across like um, other I, things they can uh, speak to. Probably. I think I remember I there remember being a ghost episode ship. <laughs> <laughs> a ghost ship episode would be a better way to phrase that. God, I, can't, I can barely remember. I remember the talking dolphin, but to ask me to remember any specific episodes. Well, what other shows do we do we reckon are, are on here? There's some very big ones on here. I want to say Red Dwarf. Yes. I want that to be on there. Red it Dwarf is, is on there. Good. That's right where it belongs. Now, I'll give you a few clues or some other ones. If this has been the place where my number one is, it's not ranking, but it's the one they mention. It's my favourite science fiction show. Doctor Who? Is that your clue? Ooh, I've never seen Doctor Who. Yes, because I've mentioned it on this show that, before. Yeah, yeah, I've mentioned I assumed you liked it because no, you've mentioned no. it a few times. Uh, no, no. What I mean is, I've, it's, there's another show that I've mentioned before is my favourite. It's, ah, okay. it's got horror elements and uh, it's got a theme tune that goes do, 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 do. do, 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 do. Oh, yeah. It's that <laughs> one that was, I, I suppose it was quite popular. For the entire duration of the decade, yes, it's uh, a, it's the X, the X Files, absolutely, yeah. Uh, X Files ah, is is, uh, is on that list. Your rendition of that iconic <laughs> theme, David, confused me even more. So that's one. Uh, let's see, number one here is. I, oh, you first. I, I know there was a resurgence of the Outer Limits. Yes. The, yeah, the, good the, show. The Twilight show. Zone style show. Uh, yeah. I remember a few episodes of that freaking me out. I think that w- that came along off the back of the success of the X-Files, didn't it? Yes, Outer Limits, uh, that is on there. Um, next one up. So, in terms of the uh, clues for this one, it's a franchise that's arguably one of the most successful sci-fi properties of the 90s. It follows a military group but uses a portal to travel to other worlds and explore. Sliders. Uh, Stargate. Right. Oh, right. That was, <laughs> sorry, SG-1. That was indeed <laughs> SG-1, but the next right. one on the list is Sliders. Ah, uh, we're both right. Yeah, so what's Sliders all about? Then? I've never heard of this one. Oh, it's like the original multiverse show. They kept going from one version of Earth to another, and each one has its own unique problem. All of this, of course, implies that our version of Earth is the correct one. <laughs> um, they're solving all these other Earths as they're going along. Mm. Well, it was it was quite similar to Quantum Leap in terms mm. of every time they sorted the issue out, they would then slide to the next yep. alternate universe. I remember one episode where they think they're finally home. He goes to try the gate. But you go, oh, this can't be my home because my gate was squeaky. Yeah. And then they go back and travel to another dimension. And then, like, you see a repairman come out the house, like, and say <laughs> bye to his mom. Or <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Next up. So, it's a, this is one of the most unique sci fi visions of the 90s. Coming at the tail end of the decade, the show follows an American astronaut 
who is accidentally sent across the galaxy and into the middle of alien conflicts. Oh, Farscape. Yes. Is Farscape any good? It's a very unique for sci-fi. A very, very unique show. There is nothing else quite like it. I think it's a lot of puppetry in it. Uh, Jim Henson's crew were involved with, I think it was Pilot and Rigel. I think other characters had effects with them as well. Now, there is one last one that aired between 1988 and 1999. I think it's actually come back more recently. So it's set in the not-too-distant future. It was the most unique sci-fi show of the 90s. A man is launched into space by a mad scientist and forced to watch terrible movies. He can keep himself sane, he builds robots that keep him company and watch the bad films with him. History Science Theatre 3000. Absolutely. So that's the 10 best non-Star Trek TV shows, or sci-fi TV shows of the History Science Theatre technically counts. It was basically just making smart comments about all films, wasn't it? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that was more the in space thing was more a framing device for the smart ass comments about the mo- bad movies they were watching. Yeah, because the bad movies themselves aren't all sci fi films, are they? No, they're just bad films. That's, that's all it has to be to qualify for uh, <laughs> Mystery Science Theater. Yeah, oh well, it's a damp squib for us. <laughs> <going on>. Anyway. <laughs> We will be uh, returning for a horror cult films episode, a typical one at some point in the near future. And after that, we come to our finale. It will be a great big stacked one. The whole Kelvin timeline. We'll be doing our personal rankings of all 13 Star Trek films. It will be hopefully a more fitting goodbye than Star Trek Nemesis. Anyway, until then, everybody, thank you very much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with these gents about these films. Right, guys? And uh, live long and prosper. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.